you here, and um, I'm just going to introduce Mr. Butterworth, who is, um, has, has a little girl in year one at the junior school, and he is the contact who's managed to get us this fantastic opportunity to listen to somebody who last spoke to the Royal Geographical Society in London, which is just so exciting. But I'm going to pass you on to Mr. Butterworth, who will say a few words uh, before Mr. Stockwell speaks. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and, and thank you also for, for coming along today. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with Clive now for, uh, for nearly a year. Um, and, and certainly from, from my perspective, I found him an incredibly inspirational guy to, to work with. He is far too modest to, to tell you about his uh, achievements. Um, but in terms of what we're going to talk about today, you know, the starting point very much being from a, a conservation perspective. But while you hear a lot of talk about conservation, it is Clive's groundbreaking work with communities in conjunction with conservation and tourism all working together uh, that's led to what was an, an award-winning and still is an award-winning program today, which is run throughout Zimbabwe and, and beyond, and, and is called Campfire. And uh, Campfire will be something that Clive will tell you a bit more about uh, today. Um, his recognition goes back to 1997, when he won the Condé Nast Award for Ecotourism. Um, he got international recognition when he was French uh, in 2011, and then most recently, uh, in September of this year, he won the inaugural Prince William Lifetime Achievement Award for Conservation in Africa. Um, so you know, Clive is, you know, is very much in the limelight globally in the conservation space. Um, hopefully what you guys will find today is you know, it will give you a little bit of insight to some of the, the challenges that are out there. Um, I will warn you now, there are some fairly harrowing pictures along the way. So uh, if they are you know, not your liking, please look away. But I think it's very important that you get a very real impression of, of what is going on uh, out there right now. What I'll do is I'm going to start with a little, uh, a little video which will sort of set the scene for you. Uh, and then I shall pass over to, to Clive to, to run you through it. It's my very great pleasure to announce Clive Stockhill as the winner of the 2013 Prince William Award for Conservation in Africa. comes up to receive his award in person, we wanted really to show you a short film which just serves to highlight his huge achievements and demonstrate just exactly why he's being honoured here tonight. The judges have selected Clive Stockhill as the inaugural winner of the Prince William Award for his remarkable vision passion and unswerving commitment to wildlife in Zimbabwe over the past 40 years. I believe these animals are a global asset. Clive is one of Africa's great conservation pioneers, a man who recognised how critical it was to engage local communities in conservation and deliver tangible benefits to ordinary people living alongside wildlife. We are coming to the visual and we are on our way. In 1990, Clive turned his own ranch into a rhino reserve and persuaded his neighbouring ranches in the Save Valley to join him, forming the biggest private conservancy in Africa. The Save Valley Conservancy has since played a key role in the repopulation and tagging of rhino in Zimbabwe and the ongoing battle against poachers. Now his conservancy is home to one of the largest rhino populations in Africa, 143 and counting. There's your honour. <laughs> Not content with saving the black rhino, Clive has also taken his fight for conservation into the neighbouring national park. The area was once the ancestral home of the Shangan people. But when it was made a national park in 1975, the Shangan were evicted and left destitute. They now saw the park and its wildlife as the enemy. 
and turned to poaching. Clive grew up in this part of the world and is one of the few white men to speak Shangon. Using his local knowledge, he brokered a peace agreement in the 1980s between the Shangon and the Zimbabwean authorities. But it's not been easy. You have to be the kind of guy who can take some hard slaps in the face and, and get up and keep going and not throw your toys out the cot. Throughout, Clive has remained doggedly true to his vision. And despite many setbacks, he's never wavered from his lifelong commitment to conservation. And when you see something as beautiful as this, you know, it's, it's like when God made this world, he created the Garden of Eden. And when he took it away, he left a bit, and this is it. Clive has made it his mission to protect this wilderness, but to do that, he's had to ensure there's a sustainable income. To attract tourists, Clive built a luxury lodge in partnership with the local Shangan community, who now staff the lodge and share in its profits. It's only through tourism that we are going to be able to continue to look after those areas. Because if there's no income, those areas will make way to other forms of land use. And one thing is for sure, once it's gone, it will never come back. It will be gone for good. What you've done, Clive, is fantastic. You've been a leader in this area of conservation and you are a shining light to so many good causes and good um, values in life. And many congratulations. Um, I think it needs nothing more said from me but to introduce Clive to take the stand. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you so much for an opportunity to come and chat to you and share with you a little bit of what we do. As you've seen, that was a Lifetime uh, Achievement Award, and it's really a story. It's, there's nothing too scientific about it. It's really just to try and explain what we've been involved with over a long period of time in trying to, what I consider to be really important, and that's to try and protect some of our, our natural assets, uh, being wildlife. If I may just explain a little bit about the, 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 the program, and I think this will explain it in some detail. Obviously, we all share a common objective. You know, we want to try and protect our environment. We want to try and ensure that the species that existed, that exist now, will continue to exist for future generations. So conservation is in the forefront of everybody's you know, objective. But in Africa, that's difficult because we're dealing with communities, human population expansion, and uh, it's really to do with space. It's not really species conservation that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the competition for space, where either humans will utilize that space at the expense of the natural species, or the humans are prepared to share that space with those species. And this is the challenge. So, you know, after leaving college and my sort of mission to go out and become the world's greatest conservationist, I found in one year that that wouldn't work. I found that there was challenges which meant that we had to deal with people before we dealt with animals, because people will decide the future of those animals. So I had to then rethink. Now, obviously, uh, if you're looking at communities, it's benefits. Um, you know, they, in their language, the Shangan language, there isn't a term that describes um, aesthetic values. So to say to them, leave that animal because it's just beautiful and it needs to be there. They don't understand that. 
and of course it's competition for them. So one has to think of benefits and uh, benefits. How do you how do you create benefits out of out of out of wildlife for a community? And of course, this is where tourism comes into it. And that was the only way I could see that if we could complete the cycle. And uh, once we realised that, uh, we then obviously engaged with the community to discuss how to do that. And we go on to the next slide, which is. Campfire, which is the acronym for Communal Areas Management Program for Indigenous Resources. Now that is, today it's a program that has expanded into 42 districts in Zimbabwe and the concept has been uh, used by other countries in Southern Africa, adapted, modified, but the principle of Campfire has gone, gone regional. And it all began um, with the project that I got involved with nearly 40 years ago. And uh, we can. The principle of, of Campfire, if I may just expand it a little bit, is it's really creating an opportunity for communities to benefit from wisely managing their natural resources. Whether it be trees or grass or animals, there has to be some form of benefit back to the communities for them to be able to, uh, to tolerate that competition. So we'll come back to Campfire after we've been through the slides and uh, obviously at the end if there are any questions I'll, I'll do my best to answer them, no guarantees that. Uh, just to put you on the map, Africa right down in the south, southern end of the continent is Zimbabwe and then of course the expanded view of Zimbabwe and then the circle basically covers the area which uh, I'm from and where I've been working for the past 40 years. It's part of the Greater Limpopo Trans Frontier Conservation Area. This is a new concept that was uh, inaugurated in 2002 uh, between the three presidents of the Southern African countries of South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, where they came up with the idea of creating cross border conservation areas uh, and taking down fences. And to me, it's, it's a brilliant idea, a brilliant concept. It obviously comes with a lot of challenges. Once again, people challenges, not animal challenges, but people challenges. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's a treaty that's been signed and the GOTFCA, as it's commonly known, uh, incorporates the Bonne Région National Park and the Sahel Valley Conservancy and the community project is within Oh, sorry, history. Yeah, history. Um, the community project is right on the edge of the Gunnery Shore and therefore it, um, uh, it gave us a great opportunity of being able to reduce the, the poaching um, uh, in the park. Uh, just to give you just an example very quickly, when this program started back in 1980, bearing in mind it was just at the, end, it was just at the time of independence, the first black government in Zimbabwe or then Rhodesia, and of course there was huge challenges on, in, on parks and the environment and uh, the poaching escalated and it was that conflict that, that sort of created an opportunity and a need for some dialogue. And because I was born in the area and I could speak the language, I was then called upon by national parks to sort of mediate with the community to try and find a way forward. And uh, it's a very long story and after six years we finally came up with the, the principles which eventually developed into campfire. Um, within that first three year period, we managed to reduce the poaching in the Gorojo National Park by 1,000%. And that was recognized by parks, and that's why the campfire program then emerged out of that. So, sorry just to take you back to, to the Gorojo Park. That's, that's the, the, the park that, we, that I've been involved with for the past 40 years. Now we're going to a bit of history, obviously a little bit about my background. And if I may just say that uh, what's, 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 uh, what should be uh, acknowledged and, and understood is that the last hundred years has seen such transformation on this planet from that was the luxury transport a hundred years ago. That's my grandfather, my dad, and my grand sitting up there. They traveled a thousand miles from the Tel to southern Rhodesia in that form of transport. We're talking 100 years ago. You look at the modern vehicles, what we are traveling in today, compare it to that. 
try and translate that into the competition for space. A hundred years ago, it seemed like the world was empty. One hundred years later, we're facing serious challenges. And we've got to come up, just like the motor industry came up with designs, we've got to come up with designs on how we can maintain the environment. This is the cargo arriving. This is all the, the uh, furniture and excess. Also, a thousand miles uh, to the new home. Next. Okay, next generation. Um, that was life. I grew up on a ranch, a lot of wildlife around. And that's my, my parents. Uh, I'm very proud sitting up here with my bone arrow. Not that I had anything to do with hunting the buffalo, but that was life when I was a child. Next. Okay, this, I'll show this because it also demonstrates the fact that this last generation has seen a huge transformation in, in, in challenges when it comes to the environment. That's me and my, I'm the youngest, um, that's me and my siblings. And there's, I saw half a pack of the African wild dog. Now back then, when I was a kid, there was a bounty on dogs because they were seen to be a, a problem. And if you took the tails of each dog to the nearest district commissioner, you got paid five pounds. So the ranchers back then made it a point to try and eliminate the dogs, get the, the bounty. And uh, it was a kind of a proud moment to be standing next to the next set of bounty. Within my lifetime, there I am, and here I am. That dog has become one of Africa's uh, most threatened species. It needs space. It's not something that you can keep in small fenced areas. Each pack requires 500 square kilometers as a home range, and will go beyond that in terms of, 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 of breeding. Just another one. Uh, this is a set different lot, once again, linking my generation with the transition to where we are today. Right, that kind of leads us now to the challenge of conservation, getting back to the cycle. Uh, the rhino is, is as you know, uh, uh, currently threatened uh, by, the, by poaching due to the, the, uh, the incredible value that has been put on its horn. Uh, albeit that horn is nothing more than your hair or your fingernails and about as the, med the medicinal value of that is about as much as you can get out of your hair and your fingernails so you know instead of buying one horn just chew your fingernails but that species has been brought to extinction in Zimbabwe alone in, in the last um, 25 years we've gone from nearly 3,000 rhinos down to 400. That gives you an indication of what we've lost. We're getting down to levels now where that species is now threatened with extinction. Silver Valley Conservancy is the area that was mentioned in the thing where we, we set up this large conservancy, uh, took down cattle, all the cattle fences, removed all the, life, the, the domestic livestock and restocked it with natural species, rhinos being one. And within the Conservancy, we have two programs that are continually we work with in terms of monitoring and conservation, and that is the African Wildlife Conservation Fund, which focuses mainly on the wild dog, but also includes other predators such as lions and leopards, hyenas, and then of course the Earth Rhino Trust, which focuses specifically on the rhino, of which I am chairman of, and uh, those two programs we work very closely together with in terms of our, of our objectives of conserving uh, uh, the biodiversity within the Saudi Valley Conservancy. Okay, it's not, only, it's not only human pressures that one faces, and I, I, I can honestly say that nature had, a, had an influence in helping us make a change from cattle production to wildlife production. And then in 1992, we, we suffered the worst drought in recorded history. That's a photograph taken on Snuka, where I come from in the Conservancy, in, uh, as you can see there, it's August 23, 1992. Uh, next. But nature given a little, bit of, a little bit of space and time and take the pressure off and a little bit of rainfall, uh, literally three years later, 
that's exactly the same position taken in the previous slide. So once again, we worked with nature rather than working against nature. Okay, having made that decision to move into, into wildlife production, uh, rhino became a flagship species. Uh, it was being threatened. Uh, the, its traditional ranges up in the northeast of the country were being heavily poached and uh, we realized that it was going to become a threatened species so we created space for it and we, we volunteered to take a few animals as, as a founder breeding stock and, uh, uh, which we built up on. And really our business now is to, to look at that, a female like that as really a, an incubator and we just want that animal to produce as many calves as possible because that's the business we're in, to produce rhinos. And if we can continue doing that, I think we're achieving our objective. Okay, to do that, is, uh, there's a lot of hard work behind it, behind the scenes. This is um, efforts during the 90s. We went through a period when the poaching was still quite, um, there, was, there was serious pressure on, on, on the rhinos. And um, in a bid to try and find ways of, of successfully uh, re reducing the, the poaching demand, we, we adopted a program where we uh, removed all the horns. Uh, and that requires uh, equipment. And in this case, uh, it, it shows a helicopter. But just for interest, if you picked up on it, those are all rhino horns that we had just dehorned uh, uh, a week or so, over a week before that. And all that horn now is safely registered and in vaults in Arari, um, and all have uh, certificates which are registered with the CITES, which is the control of tr the control and trade of, the, of endangered species, which is a global organization. So we know it's there, and it removed the incentive um, for the poachers to poach. But it's also important to know that a horn will regrow in, in two to three years back to its normal size. So you know it's it's a temporary uh, it's a temporary measure, but it does have it does have some value. Part of the team is the monitors. Uh, this is a team of people that are working literally 24/7 in the conservancy, and they're out every day, and every single animal is named, tagged, numbered and they're out there we we don't just accept a verbal uh, report that they've seen such and such an animal we require them to bring back a photograph so that we've got a database a photo database of every animal virtually every month we'll know where every animal is because of the photo thing and that's the team that does that part of the equipment that is required is a fixed wing which is normally goes up uh, first and uh, locates the trackers on the ground and once the trackers are located and the animal is located that aeroplane will stay way up above so it doesn't disturb the rhino and then by radio the helicopter and the other team are called in then the operation continues. That is the, the helicopter that comes in now to do the darting and in some cases we've had to move animals because they're in vulnerable areas or from a genetic point of view we want to move males around uh, you, need, you need specialized equipment to be able to move rhinos and that's a metal crate, a crane and a, and a, and a box on the back of a four-wheel drive truck and uh, it's, it's, once you've got all that equipment it's actually relatively easy to move rhinos around. As I was saying just now, monitoring is very important. Uh, the Lofa Rhino Trust team are there. Uh, that's one of the monitors uh, taking a picture of the rhino. Um, it's a dangerous work and uh, rhinos have got a very short fuse and can be very aggressive. Um, I've had a personal encounter with one that really beat me up badly but uh, survived. So it's not, an, it's not an easy job to uh, get that close, take a picture and get away without the encounter. The other method of monitoring is uh, camera traps at night. A lot of animals are shy, so they're difficult to find. And uh, we have camera traps set up at water points, etc. And we will also be able to identify. You'll notice by that animal is ear notch. And there's a code in ear notching 
which we can number animals from one to a thousand just by different positions of the ear notches. So the tags that tags don't last. You put an ear tag in and it'll last three months because of the, the brush and the, it, it annoys the animals and it hurts it all. Uh, but the ear notches are the ultimately the, the way of identifying uh, each individual. Okay, this needs a little bit of explanation. This is the sort of uh, rhino stats for the last 30 years in Zimbabwe. Um, and compared to losses recently in South Africa, the blue is Zimbabwe, the red is South Africa. If we go back to the, the early 80s, in this period here, this is when we had 3,000 rhino in Zimbabwe. And those were the losses we had during that time. It was in '92 that Silo Valley set up, and we realised that we were that there was a need to set up a, a, a population away from the the uh, call it the killing zone up in the northeast. And once we had moved animals and we had adopted a new strategy and sort of anti-poaching, you'll notice that in Zimbabwe the blue basically dries up. We lost no runners for that period of time. And then again in 2000 it started. And that's when the price went up. It, the price has, has gone up probably 20 to 30 fold in the last seven to eight years. Um, you know, we don't, we don't like to publicize it, but the fact is that it is in fact, it's worth more than gold at the moment in terms of weight. But what is interesting is that, yes, while we, this is uh, Zimbabwe as a whole, uh, Zimbabwe did lose a lot in 2008, but what is encouraging is that since then, the Zimbabwe uh, losses have been reducing, and that's because of all the effort, uh, compared to what's happening in South Africa. I mean, look at that, that red. They're already over 800 this year, and they'll probably end up losing over 1,000 rhino by the end of this year, which means that they're losing just over three rhinos a day. Every single day, we are here, three rhinos are dying in South Africa. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to look at the positive, and here you've got the blue line, is rhinos in the private conservancies like Sali Valley Conservancy, Blueberry Conservancy, Money Lungi uh, Trust. Uh, that's what's happened in the population since 1992 when we started the conservancies. There's been a, a gradual increase. This was that blip in 2008, and then it picked up again, and we, we are now heading in the right direction. Compared to the red dots, which is uh, the state protected lands where there's where there's minimal resources uh, not lack of effort but lack of equipment lack of motivation lack of of even getting down to sort of um, paying the right sort of salaries and people are not motivated and just because of that the poachers have seen an obvious uh, opportunity and that's what's happening in the protected areas uh, which is not good for us or the rhino. So we, we, we have to work closely with parks now to try and get that red line also turning and taking a, a, an upward trend. This is what we're facing in terms of threat. Uh, that's an AK-47 that's had a modified silencer put on the end. That silver canister there reduces the noise so that when they're out in the field, uh, and if there's patrols in the area, you have to be very really close to hear the sound, and those are quite effective in terms of minimizing the sound. And that weapon there is probably responsible, uh, when I say that weapon, that model weapon, the AK-47, has been responsible for probably 90% of our losses uh, of, of rhino in Zimbabwe. The other means of, of, of poaching is uh, a wire snare. Now, that may not look like a snare, but I can assure you there's, there's I think, about 8,000 snares uh, stacked up on, on, on those pipes. A snare is basically a piece of, of galvanized or copper wire, uh, normally about four meters or four or five yards long, 
and uh, with a noose on the end, which they set in the path of an animal, and when it either passes through, it gets caught around the neck, or quite often it happens to get its foot caught, and it's, it's, it's with disastrous results. That's a rhino bull that walked into this snare. This is the, it's a double wire because they were sitting for a big animal. Uh, and that's the damage it does um, if not treated. This poor animal, I mean, luck wasn't on its side. It happened to get caught in two different snares on, on a front foot and a back foot. And that wire just cuts right through the skin, the flesh, right to the bone. And uh, if not treated, that animal is certain to die. Fortunately, this animal was located uh, in time. Uh, we got in the vets, we brought in the darts, we put it, down, we immobilized it and treated it. And as we speak, that animal is back in the herd and uh, very healthy and re fully recovered. It's unselective. That happens to be an elephant foot. Um, and that's what a little piece of wire can do to one of, you know, <laughs> one of the largest animals on the planet. Just uh, one cord of wire can immobilize it. Unfortunately, the damage caused to that elephant was way beyond treatment and that animal actually didn't, re didn't recover. The effects of the demand for horn is poachers kill riders to take off their horns to then sell to the market. It's a gruesome picture, but that's reality. This particular bull uh, was um, shot with a female very close to each other, uh, both killed by the poachers, but it was where our patrols were very close and our patrols were able to get in very quickly. And as you can see, uh, only had time to remove one horn, they hadn't even gotten to the front horn. Although it had been dehorned, they still didn't have time to take it off before the patrols came in and uh, disturbed them. At, on that particular day, the poachers got away, but about three months later, we knew who they were, we were we, our intelligence had identified who they were and where they lived, and about three months later we were successful in apprehending them and they've been subsequently been sentenced and are in jail today. Other me methods of monitoring and trying to protect rhinos is uh, implanting transmitters into the horn. Um, a rhino has a very uh, sort of a difficult shaped head to place a collar on like most other animals. Other animals that have a collar put around the neck with a transmitter on the collar. But with a rhino, the only thing that holds it on is its ears. And if, if, if that conveyor belt rubs, rubs up against the back of the ears, we've had them where the conveyor belt actually cuts into the ears. Or sometimes the ears fold over and the, and, the, and the transmitter comes off. So we had to think of a new technique. And the way to do it was we, we managed to, to, to talk to the producers of the transmitters and ask them to reduce the size. And here what you see is, that's the horn. And under that red, that's just a, a, a red plastic holding the, the resin in. We drill a hole of about an uh, inch and a half wide and about two inches deep, which we fit the transmitter in, and then we drill down through the center of the horn into that cavity and pull the aerial up. You can see the aerial there, which will get trimmed off, which is not a problem. It gets trimmed off and it takes the shape of the horn. And then we fill in the gap with a, with a hard epoxy that red plaster is just to hold the epoxy in and as soon as the animal gets up, the first thing he does, he goes to a tree and he rubs it off and now we've got an animal that is being monitored by a satellite. That animal now can be tracked at any point in time as to where it is, what's it doing, etc. If it starts moving out of its territory at, at a rate, you quickly get into an airplane and you track it and you get the guys on the ground to help arrest. And in one case, we we, in tracking the transmitter, it led us to a, to a communal area, which is adjacent to the conservancy, and into a village. So we got onto the ground and we went down and we 
with the receiver and walked into the village and the, the beep continued coming out of the hut. And we broke into the hut and we looked up into the thatch and there was the horn with the transmitter beeping up in the hut. So they do, they do have a role, although the poachers are getting uh, uh, aware of that now. And of course the first thing they do is if they suspect a, a transmitter, they will get in there with a chisel and hammer and, 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 and immobilize it. Uh, this is uh, the other technique which I explained is dehorning. Uh, this is a large bull. This bull occurred in a, in a vulnerable area and we feared that the poachers would be after it so we decided to remove the horn. And that's how it's done. So you mobilize it with a drug called M99 and it's amazing. You only need about two milligrams of M99 to knock down a one ton, one and a half ton black rhino. And once it's down, um, the, that's a vet there, uh, a very famous vet in Zimbabwe who's worked on rhinos for many years. And uh, he gets in and stabilizes the animal and then whoops out the chainsaw, which is the quickest way to do it. It's very, very quick. And obviously one's got to be very careful that you don't cut down into the quick. And of course the vets now uh, uh, have mastered the technique and uh, they quickly take the horn off which then goes off to safekeeping and the animal bounces up and starts growing the next one. So at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. We have to produce those little guys because that's a link with the next generation. And unless we can continue producing them, we as a generation will have failed. Moving very quickly on now, it's not only rhinos that we are, we are looking after, Bearing in mind, I mentioned earlier on that the, the wild dogs are, are now in danger of becoming extinct and uh, uh, the African wild dog group that are monitoring and working with dogs, that's Dr. Rosemary Groom. She's, uh, she works, lives and works in the Conservancy, focusing on wild dogs and uh, other predators. Here, there's the dart in the rump uh, and there's the removing, removal of the snake. There's the, the wire snare that was around the neck and that was the cut through the neck. And that was a successful operation. Once again, that animal needs space. And we as humans have got to understand that unless we got prepared to share space and create those large areas which dogs need, um, we are going to lose them. And if we do happen to to, to, to come to some understanding and create that space. We don't have to worry about their cons conservation. They look after themselves, as, as demonstrated there. They, they are prolific breeders and they can, they can build their populations very rapidly, but they need tolerance and space. Another species which has unfortunately faced, uh, 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 is facing a challenge now is the vulture families. This is a leopard faced vulture, but we have five species in southern Africa which are all being affected, and their threat is, is, is uh, secondary poisoning. Uh, the poachers now are turning to another, um, another tool, uh, which I, I term a tool of mass destruction, uh, and that is the use of agricultural and mining chemicals. Um, in this case, the poachers used Temic, which is a, a, an agricultural chemical used to, to treat nematodes in soil. It's a deadly poison. Uh, it's, it's, one of its common names is two-step. They say that you, if you take that, you only take two steps before you die. That elephant had taken a small watermelon and it had Temic injected into it. The elephant then had eaten the watermelon and it died. The poachers were close at hand and there is, there is a small market in South Africa for particularly the beaks of a vulture, uh, a lot of superstition and similar values. And I think the poachers saw an opportunity here and what they did was they went to the carcass and cut open the skin and laced it with more chemical and went back and sat for a couple of hours. The vultures came in and on one elephant we lost 285 vultures on one carcass. Now that's a mass destruction. I mean, vultures, if we continue that way, vultures are going to be very rapidly moving to that critical level in, in, in conservation.
She directs operations from the helicopter while all the trucks are on radio contact on the ground. So the trucks are not far behind when Clem finds a suitable elephant family and herds them nearer to the road. Each one is darted as the helicopter circles to keep them contained in a small area. The helicopter lands nearby and Clem arrives to take control. I don't think I've seen anything like this in my life. The whole family is down. If it was a culling, uh, your heart would be going out to them, but you know that this family is actually just on its way to a new home. And uh, you see the baby over there, obviously mixed up, but uh, she's going to be moving off with the family, so don't worry about that. It looks rather confusing, but everybody has a specific job to do. before he checks up on all the adults. Chop, chop, chop. Is it okay? Yeah. That's fine. Okay. He must give them antibiotics to prevent infection. And then a reference number is painted on the stick on its feet. Um, reasonably happy. It's flapping its ears, which means it's uh, not quite content, but uh, certainly not creating too much of a fuss inside this truck. The long-lasting effects of the tranquilizer help to keep the elephants calm while they take on a journey that could last up to 20 hours. It's not lack of expertise, but rather lack of funds which hampers the efforts of Clem and his team. If they had more trucks and better facilities, Clem has no doubt he could achieve a zero mortality rate. And, providing he can find homes for them, he would be able to take enough of Zimbabwe's elephants to be able to start That's coming all together. So At last it's time for the family to make its way back into the wild. Free from the threat of coming, and safe from the devastation of an overgrazed reserve. taken back in 92 by a, uh, uh, a video camera that it got converted to, to digital so we've lost clarity over the process. That elephant translocation where we moved 550 elephants in family units from the Gunnery Jaw National Park to South African Conservancy was the first ever exercise undertaken where that number and in family units was undertaken. It was proved to be a huge success. And the 550 that we moved to Saibu now exceed 1,500. So they've trebled their population in, in just on, on 20 years. A true success in terms of, of conservation. The reason being was the creation of the Saibu Valley Conservancy, which is nearly a million acres, created the space which had no elephants. So once we created the space, we brought in a founder population and then they knew how, what, how, how best to get on with life and they reproduced and they now up to 1,500. Um, so I'm slightly mindful that the class is started back in five minutes so we're, we're going to fly through the next two sections just to sort of put it into context with community and, and, okay. and tourism. Okay, getting back to communities, that part of that cycle, communities, very important to bring communities in. This is the Shangdan uh, woman, the traditional skirts. Chief Mahenya, who is the chief I worked with back in the, in the early 80s, uh, a, a very strong supporter of the campfire principle, and uh, uh, he, I, I attribute the, a lot of the success to, to his foresight. <coughs> this is originally bringing in the benefits from uh, wise use of the resource, communities getting, getting their cash dividends, which they then put into community projects, paid their levies, and, and paid um, uh, individual dividends. This is the current community leadership at Mahenia's with the new chief and his elders, who we meet with the first Friday of every month. We have a meeting, and that's the team that we meet with. This is one of the cultural community meetings that uh, uh, we have annually. And it's a great opportunity to, to explain the benefits of incorporating conservation 
uh, objectives, maintaining a healthier environment, which translates to a healthier human, uh, you know, human life. So it's a great opportunity. These are the chiefs surrounding Bonnery Jour National Park. Uh, these festivals will, will bring in all the chiefs, they're all Shangans, they all sh speak the same language, and uh, it's a great opportunity to share ideas and to cross-pollinate in terms of, 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 of successes. This is a notorious poacher. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in the early, in the early 80s when uh, the, the communities increased poaching, he was one of the, 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 uh, the ringleaders. Um, and unfortunately, he has since left us, but before he died, he became a staunch supporter of, of wise use and, and, and protection of the resource. And once again, I'm sure you all agree that it's that generation that's going to determine our future with regards to the efforts that we are making now. We work very closely with uh, these communities. This is the school at Mahenia, this is the, 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 the primary school at Mahenia. 700 children. In, at that school, and uh, you know, their their grandparents were all uh, uh, hunters and gatherers, and 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 appreciate the value of the environment. But because of the ex the rapid expansion of human numbers, they're facing a situation where you know they can't continue with those activities, and it has to be controlled. And this is the generation that's got to start understanding how to share space. Okay, this is just some traditional events that happen annually, uh, which are unique to the Shanghai community, which makes them stand out. That's preparing lunch, um, you know, uh, cornmeal, we call it sadza out there, cornmeal, a thick porridge and a stew relish is, is staple. I mean, that if, if the country ran out of cornmeal, there would be a riot. These, this is now leading into to tourism. Uh, these cultural festivals are bringing in tourists, and then we get into tourism. Now, this is a means of getting some benefit back to the communities. This is in the Gunnarijor National Park with tourists. We're talking about Z Zimbabwe here, and we've got some big icons. We've got the Victoria Falls. We've got the Great Monuments, which is the second largest archaeological feature on the continent of Africa after the pyramids. That's Chila Lodge, the lodge we discussed earlier on, which is where Steve and I are involved. Uh, we are both directors of that, and we work with the communities to ensure that there is a benefit that goes back to the community. And the support of these sort of facilities is critical to, to the long-term conservation and understanding from the communities. These are just some of the scenes that one would see if you, if you stayed at Chila and you, you, you did the activities. Uh, this is right in the middle of the Bonarijor. This is an icon of Chilojo Cliffs. And of course, it's in, in brief terms, Gunnarijor means place of the elephant. And uh, the last survey has put over 10,000 elephants in Gunnarijor. So it's a, it's a conservation and success. And these are some of the activities we do, walks, um, drives, and uh, uh, when we go back to the lodge. This is a set of, 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 of pans uh, in there, which is under the IUCN, considered to be an important bird area. Uh, some of the species that you'll encounter on your drives, a big herd of buffalo, and that's sunset. We're getting back to where we started, and we've got that full cycle. Conservation will only, will only succeed, certainly in Africa, if we can bring in the communities and the way to bring in communities to, through tourism. And uh, so therefore we are strongly urging people to support those programs now before it's too late. If I may just end off by saying, I know there is resistance about Zimbabwe, and a lot of people feel that Zimbabwe is not a safe destination. I can assure you, I've just come from there. I feel a lot safer in Zimbabwe than I would be in South Africa. And if you don't recognize the need to support these community programs now, finally, when the West comes to the realization that let's go out and see, it might be too late, we may have lost so we urge people to support conservation through tourism now and come. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.
to say thank you very much, Mr. Stoffer, for coming today and just talking to us about so many different aspects. I mean, it's not just about, it's so, it, it's so apparent that it's not just about conservation, it's about working that in with, with tourism and with the community as well. Um, and I know that a lot of you are very interested in those sorts of projects and those sorts of ideas. So it's not just about the science side of things, but um, the, the geography and also that whole sort of helping, helping. Um, I don't know if anybody has got any questions uh, that they wanted to ask, um, and I wondered whether, because we've got lessons in here now, whether if any of the six formers are free and wanted to ask any questions, I know you wanted to, didn't you? Uh, whether you you could come up to my office, and I'll, I'll take our visitors up to my office, and then you could come in there and, 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 and talk to him in there. I think that's the best thing, because then there's a lesson happening in here. But well done for coming.